The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss supportive care in brain tumors. My name is Christine Daly, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tobias Walbert. Dr. Walbert is a board certified neurologist, neuro-oncologist, and palliative care and hospice physician. He is the co-director of the Hermelin Brain Tumor Center at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. His research focuses on finding a cure for brain tumors, as well as helping patients and their families with symptom management, advanced care planning, communication, and end-of-life decision-making. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Walbert. You may now begin your presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I wish you a good afternoon, and thank you for uh, attending our webinar today. And I would like to thank the ABTA to uh, give me the opportunity to present uh, on this topic that's really dear to me. Um, let's get started. And uh, these are my disclosures. They should not have any influence. So the first thing I just would say is like um, take take a look at your screen and think about what quality of life looks for you. And maybe when you think about how that may have changed for this little girl, this little boy jumping down the, the dunes on Lake Michigan or this young gentleman climbing up or skiing, visiting the mountains, relationships, families, or just your favorite restaurant, your favorite cup of coffee or tea, and uh, this is the obligatory palliative care hand-holding pictures, being together. So it is really what you see is what is your quality of life about. Everybody of my patients, when I ask them typically, they have a pretty good idea of what's important to them. And that's what's important when we talk about quality of life and when we go through a disease that is hard to maneuver. So when we look more on a systematic perspective, quality of life is here in the center, but it's really made out of many other different things such as physical function, social function. Cognition is really important. And then there is something like uh, called spiritual well-being and emotional function. All of these are, have certain symptom severity that we can measure and uh, health, and they define our quality of life, the health-related quality of life. How does that, what does that mean for the treatment team uh, when we look at that? And the, it becomes obvious that for clinicians are sometimes the physician's perspective is a little bit different. So as physicians, uh, we, we look and we have to look at when we meet with our patients, uh, look at tumor response, how does the MRI look like? We are very much interested in the overall survival because that's what we all do. We all want to beat this disease and, and we look at the progression-free survival. For our patients and their families, however, there is there's much more than as a physician I see at times. There is uh, what we call vitality. There is role limitations. That certain things that used to be normal are not normal any longer. There are emotional problems caused by uh, the tumor itself, by steroids, other medications. So there's mental health, there's quality of life, and there's maintaining hope. And yes, there is the overall survival and progression-free survival, but that's not always the whole picture. So how, how do we handle this as a team? Um, many different people are involved in the care of our operation, uh, brain tumor patients. And all of them, they do all of an impact on the quality of life of our patients and their families and caregivers. There's radiation oncology, the neurosurgeon right in the beginning, uh, neuro-oncology, medical oncology. And then there's nursing care, physical therapy and rehab, getting, getting you back on your feet, 
and uh, social work, maneuvering all these uh, challenges that come around. And yes, there is palliative care and behavioral health. Palliative care is one of the issues, uh, the topics I want to talk a little bit more about because not as much is known and many patients ask me about it. Because one big part is if to remember we cannot change the direction of the wind, but we can always adjust our sails. So let's think about what we can do to make the, un, uh, the, the dreadable disease more livable. I want to start with this little cartoon of one of my mentors. Uh, he published it uh, now already like uh, almost eight years ago. So when you go on a road trip, um, you can have different attitudes. You can be more like I and I'm sometimes you say, wow, let's have a good time, be hopeful and maybe unrealistic. Nothing bad will happen, let's go on the road. But you almost will be assured if your car isn't really up to sniff, you haven't changed the oil and if you don't have a triple A and uh, anything else, you're going to know that this will be a hard trip to go on to. It's almost unsure this will be an uncomfortable ride, unprepared, and you will maybe reach your goal, but not in the best way. The, a different attitude might be, and when, especially when we think about uh, brain tumor di diagnosis as a, as a journey that we are all on there. There will be bumps in the road. I tell my patients there will be bumps in the road and and I will be there for them. But uh, we have to, we almost can predict them. And part of that is make the team work for you. Basically we say, we are hopeful. This is gonna be good, but realistic as well, there might be some bumps in the road. So I want to ensure maximal comfort while traveling, and I have the AAA. My tank is full, the oil is changed, and the heat is working, especially on a day like today here, where we we have like almost zero degree. So what is palliative or supportive care? So uh, the broadest definition is probably that it is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness. So that really hits it for brain tumors, for most of them, especially the high-grader ones. And it's the prevention of relief of suffering. So basically looking early and trying to prevent it and to treat it, treat pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So um, palliative care is not hospice. Um, while there has been more and more knowledge and my patients are more and more informed about it, it's hospice, I tell people, hospice is palliative care at the end of life. Uh, here in the U.S., because of Medicare requirements, it's a little bit arbitrary, we say less than six months of life expectancy. But it's important to know and to remember when your physician brings that up, or if you want to ask your physician about this, is that neither hospice nor palliative care shorten life. It's not their goal. And hospice play, can take care at home, at nursing homes, inpatient units, and the hospital. Hospice really has a very old tradition. The first hospice was were like in the 11th century before Christ, when uh, after Christ, before when when the Crusaders went out to the Holy Land, and a lot of them they did not return, and so we have this like this is a picture of an old Crusader hospice in old Jerusalem, where people came found refuge when they couldn't make it home. So it it comes really from the Latin word host being a guest. Many, many years later, 1967, that is really thought to be the more modern palliative or hospice uh, idea. When in, in London, Dame Cicely Saunders started St. Christopher Hospice in London. And that is like thought to be the more, the modern hospice. 
And that came several years later into the US and North America. So what can hospice do for people? So hospice can come and send out a nurse one to three times a week normally. And the biggest really advantage that I tell my patients when we talk about this is, is that you have a phone number to call 24 seven. Because normally when things happen, then it's at Friday night at six or it's on Sunday when you call the office and of course, you know, uh, will be say, sent straight to the operator or the resident and all they can tell you is you should come to the next emergency room. So um, other parts of hospice is that there's social worker counseling physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutrition, speech therapy, all these can be part of hospice. And sometimes it can be respite uh, care, like that uh, to have the loved one um, for some days in a, in a care setting. But um, it is important to remember that hospice normally is not, cannot send out somebody who's there physically 24 seven. Hospice can help with that camp advanced care planning and hospice is there for the families after the death of their loved ones. What palliative care can do is really looking at pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, nausea, in severe cases of nausea, and other distressing symptoms. Really, and that is more and more delivered outpatient as well as inpatient. So we have at Henry Ford, for example, have an outpatient clinic where we patients can see them parallel while seeing us. So when you look at that, and I like to always to go in little picture, you see here palliative care, it can serve like the umbrella, the umbrella to uh, bur ease the burden from symptoms, to maintain hope, and by doing that, to increase the health related and the general quality of life. The way palliative care and hospice used to be is was like this it was like the medical oncologist, the neuro oncologist, who did everything possible, and then then there was that dreadful day where the physician said, "Oh, I am so sorry. There is nothing more I can do for you," and uh, refer them to hospice. And uh, the, the issue with that is really referrals come too late. To make a difference in symptoms. And patients refer too late for meaningful decision making and for proper reasons. They felt abundant at times. So over time, this paradigm has changed and to bring palliative care in earlier. And by palliative care, this doesn't necessarily has to be a separate team. It can be, but it can be delivered by your neuro-oncologist as well. Palliative care means to address advanced care planning. It uh, means addressing nausea, constipation, all these symptoms that make my life more miserable. And patients are earlier engaged so that they still can, are able to engage in meaningful decision making. And you can develop a more trusting relationship. So palliative care really integrates the psychological and the spiritual aspects of patient care. And it's a support system that helps family to cope. And as that, physicians, their physicians, mid-level providers, social work volunteers, spiritual counseling, all of them are here in the ideal setting. And, when, and it's again, as I mentioned before, palliative care intends neither to hasten nor to postpone death. That is not the role. So how does that work, that integrated palliative care? After all, um, we want to know, uh, does that make a difference? There was uh, now already uh, eight years ago, this was like a very big study that really changed the way we thought about palliative care. So uh, Dr. Tamil, uh, an oncologist, and palliative care specialist at uh, the Mass General Hospital in Boston uh, looked at early palliative care, basically the, the, the model that we just looked at, 
and had patients with metastatic lung cancer involved. And they looked at this early palliative care versus standard of care. And so what happened is, is when they looked here, so the blue is the standard of care and this rose uh, color here is just like the early palliative care. Depression was really significantly decreased. Anxiety was significantly lower and depression, this is a different kind of scale again, was really much better. And in addition to that, they looked at a general quality of life score and that was much better. And on top of that, which was not really intended to be, but patients on early palliative care lived longer than the standard care patients. So, but what does that mean for our patients, for brain tumor patients? So several years ago, we looked at that and looked in the literature to see what is important in brain tumors, what are the symptoms that bother patients, especially uh, later in the disease. And here, when we look, these were like general cancer patients, and we saw there was fatigue, weight loss, appetite loss, and then this what's called neurological symptoms. Well, nobody really reported in detail about that. So uh, when we looked at the brain tumors, there were some retrospective studies. We saw, you see this range here from from 30 to 64, drowsiness from 40 to 90. So these are huge ranges, and that was because we didn't, didn't really know. So uh, what we did then is, like at our institution here, uh, we looked at patients and their caregivers to see how does end of life look like for brain tumor patients. This really colorful, busy slide, as we say, uh, I use that to show you one thing. Like these are the weeks prior to death. So we started like 12 to 14 weeks prior. And what you can see is everything goes up here. Drowsiness here, fatigue, appetite. So concentrating. All of that gets much worse at uh, prior to death. Life is so much brighter when we focus on what's truly matters. So, so what does that mean? What are the challenges at end of life? So in our study, when we looked at this, weakness, concentration, drowsiness, fatigue, speaking, remembering, and understanding. So these were really the main issues that patients had. That is what really... Um, created the main issues. So what do they all have in common? When you look at these highlighted ones, all of these really six of the highest symptoms involve decision-making capacity. So that is really important because it means it's like at, uh, if we wait too long to address this, and I say with we, I mean uh, from a physician perspective, but that includes as well our patients and families. If we don't do that, then we might not be able to do this. Um, the, the real challenge is what we see, and a lot of times when we start this conversation in the clinic, uh, my patients, my, the families, they ask me, what, what should we expect? And because we did that study, we, we know a little bit better what to expect. Um, and I say it's like one of the good things is that pain really does not play a major role. But seizures um, can have severe consequences, although they are quite rare. Communication is one of the biggest pieces and getting sudden neurologically weaker. And patients are unable to participate in end of life decision making. So what what is one of the main questions at this point that we are working on is when and how is the right time to address these issues? So here's Mr. Elephant. I'm right there in the room and no one even acknowledges me. And that's what uh, a lot of times happens 
um, with patients talking about the inevitable. We spend a lot of times uh, talking, bringing people into the world, and when you think about it, and but it's very clear, and I always tell my patients, if there's one thing for sure in this room is that we all are gonna die. And we just, we don't know when, and but we, we need to address this. And most people do feel better, and it does not, have a negative impact on hope. Um, studies were done and did not show that. So what can these triggers be in brain tumor care? Uh, one, it can be just with periodic assessment with clinic visits. Some programs now started to say, okay, it's like we, we talk about that. That's part of our clinical practice when a tumor when it looks on the MRI that a tumor is coming back, the first, the second, the third time, these are the times when we talk about that. We check in with the patient and their families. Or, and this is what we call event-driven. So progression on MRI, second line, chemotherapy, when symptoms are getting worse, when the quality of life is not there anymore, or decrease in performance status. And one thing, and that I really want to give that to to my to you as families, as patients, is physicians are overly optimistic in prognostication and survival. And that has something to do with that as much as we do this every day, um, we're just human beings like everyone else. And that, of course, uh, the more we know our patients, their families, the dearer they are to our hearts, the more difficult it is to make these prognoses. So why do, should we do this advanced care planning? Why bother to go through that exercise? And because at the end of the day, a lot is not in our control. A lot in life is beyond our control, no matter how hard we try, and especially in a disease like that. But to realize, to recognize, there are certain things that I can control and that is important. Advanced care planning is basically making decisions about the health care you would want to receive if you are unable to speak yourself. And because of the data I showed you earlier that a lot of patients lose that capacity. And that is important. And I always tell my patients, this is important to talk about it, to get somebody involved, to have that conversation is important because um, things are going to happen and you're going to need somebody to speak for you. And... Um, that when the person that makes these decisions knows about what you want, it protects that person that you love because they know exactly what you want, even if it's hard for them to do, and it makes sure that the things happen, are happening in the way you want them to happen. So completing an advanced care directive, and most hospital systems now have these when you ask the nurse, the social worker, or the physician at your next visit. It's like when you complete this advanced care directive, you put into writing what types of treatment you would or would not want and who you choose to speak for you and should you be unable to speak for yourself. And by doing that, uh, you prevent issues. You prevent that, there is an, that it's not sorted out who will talk about, who may will make these decisions in your family and families and caregivers are not sure about the patient's wishes. So, and uh, all the issue I talked about is that's why we really encourage advanced care plan. This here is a little uh, reality check, I would call that. It's about like from a website call, uh, called the Conversation Project. So. Think about that. 80% of people say that if they're seriously ill, they would want to talk to their doctor about end-of-life care. But then when asked, 
only 7% of patients report having an end-of-life conversation with their doctor. The other part is 82% of people say it's important to put their wishes into writing. But when you look at the end of day, only 23% of people really have done it. And I understand sometimes it is not in our society what we like to do, and it's not the most pleasant things. In the same way, like at times when young couples get married, have maybe have their first child, it's like that was like the moment, like when I sat down with my wife and we said, it's like, okay, it's like, this is, uh, we don't even want to think about that. This is a horrible idea, but well, what do we do? What do we want to happen with our kids when the airplane comes down on the trip we go together? So it is good to have these conversations. The main components really about advanced care planning is are twofold. The first important thing in that is really is about having the conversation. Sitting down with your loved one or the one you identified and ask them about if they feel comfortable doing that or if they can imagine making these decisions for you when you can't make them. And it's about documenting treatment wishes and preferences and to have a healthcare power of attorney. The other part is a last will and testament, but it's really these parts here that I uh, focus on with my patients. Because 90% of people say talking with their loved ones about end of life care is important, but only one third have actually done so. Another one here is 60% of people say that making sure their family is not burdened by tough decisions is extremely important to them. But then 56% have not communicated their end of life wishes. So that's why we need conversations. How can we do them? And fortunately, besides the, the pamphlets and the flyers that you uh, are able to get in your hospitals, there are a number of really good websites out there now that help you to make these decisions. One is here, this uh, caringinfo.org, and where you can click yourself through here. Uh, advanced care planning, caregiving, questions about hospice and palliative care and grief and loss. Another one that uh, has been really successful uh, in some states and healthcare system is called the Conversation Project. That is, some hospitals offer that to meet basically with a facilitator that helps you to walk through the steps. Because at the end of the day, when we think about that, it is you're not dying of cancer. You're not dying from cancer. You're living with it. And this is all about really making the best out of uh, life as we have it, even if it is sometimes not as we imagined it. Um, at this point, I, I would like to open this up for uh, questions. I don't know if we have gotten any there, Christine? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Walbert. Um, yes, we will now take questions. If you have a question you would like to ask, please type and submit it using the question box in the webinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, your first question, Dr. Walbert, is if a 76-year-old patient is diagnosed with glioblastoma in your hospital, who's responsible for starting the discussion of palliative care, and when should that conversation take place? That's a very good question because that uh, um, it gets a little bit too... Uh, in, <laughs> It's a tricky question. So I, I truly believe that it can be from uh, different perspectives, different uh, teams. But at the end of the day, I, as a neuro-oncologist, I see it as my 
part of my role as physician on taking care of my patients to bring up this conversation. That said, when patients come into the hospital, a lot of times there's a natural way because one of the things like the, what the residents on the team admitting the patients a lot of time will uh, will discuss is it's like what should we do when the patient's heart is stopping to beat? Should we shock it and should we should the patient be on a ventilator and and all these kind of questions and and that already is like one of these questions that's really important to think about it um, how you want to be so um, the, there is no good answer this can be addressed by the admitting team uh, the oncology team that can be addressed by the surgical team or it can be addressed uh, through a palliative care consult because these uh, obviously these uh, physicians are specially trained in these conversations and have the best overview what else uh, how can a plan look like that focuses really on symptom management pain management and quality of life Thank you, Dr. Walbert. The next question is, if all of your relatives have passed, do your friends have the power, if you give it to them, to speak on your behalf? Yes, they do. And uh, it does not always have to be a family member. Um, when, we, when we get older, we find out that families can be complicated. And, and sometimes it can be very hard for uh, to or difficult to make these decisions for the ones we love the most. So I had patients who did not want their next of kin or their loved ones to make these decisions, but rather a good friend. And that is really the situation where it becomes really, really important that this is documented in the power of attorney document and so that the physician knows that is really the the one to make the decisions and to take care of that and not necessarily the the estranged daughter or son or someone else. Thank you. Uh, and another question. Um, do you have any advice or words of wisdom from your experience um, of how to raise the subject either with a loved one or with a patient, how to start that conversation? Well, um, in an ideal world, um, you we, we sometimes still wait that the physician brings this up. But it does not have to be the physician. Um, there's nothing wrong with um, bringing this up from the patient's perspective and I encourage my patients um, and a lot of times it's like I, I um, might even they, they then they say oh we talked already about this and and then we can move on but um, I think it's always it's good in it's better to bring it up when in a good situation what do I mean by that it's always very difficult to to make these decisions in crisis mode. It's much better to have a conversation and different steps. That's the the other part. This is a process. This is, uh, in my experience, this is uh, for most people. This is more than a one-time conversation. It's like a, a constant checking in as well because things might change. It's like even while especially when while the the disease is is evolving when at times it becomes more clear that the tumor might uh, at some point take over um it it adds a different component than uh talking about that um i typically don't talk about this like at the first visit people come because uh they, they need treatment, they want treatment, and that's what we do. Well, I, I truly believe in the power of hope. And 
So um, we this is nothing to approach right from the get go. But once we build a relationship, we have a conversation about that, and it evolves over time. Thank you. Uh, another question: Do you have any um, guidance on how a tumor board discussion? could impact the direction for a patient to go to hospice, meaning more than just one doctor making that decision? Oh, yeah, we, we do that. Uh, we do this uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, tumor board uh, conversations have direct impact on the care of our patients. And it can be like where, like uh, very simply said, that the surgeon says, uh, I don't think, uh, the patient will benefit from more surgery in the same way the radiation oncologist uh, saying the same. Or sometimes, too, is like just, uh, just uh, reviewing the images and how a patient is doing. It's like to, to raise the question, <clears throat> are we really doing the right thing here? Because just like one thing, uh, there's still at times that perception that that one day there might be that dreadful conversation where the, the doctor says, I'm so sorry, there is nothing we can do for you. But in, in my experience, there, there's always something, something we can do. But that, is, that raises the question, is that, what we, is that really what we should do? Is that always in the best interest of the patient? Okay, and uh, one last question. Does palliative care require the patient to continue taking medicines or advised treatment? Um, so that is a good point, and, and I think that's like one of these finer points between palliative care and hospice. So palliative care is really, <clears throat> I, I see that complementary, parallel to the normal visit. You could think about that in the same way you see a physical therapist or <clears throat> you just see a, a, another specialist focus on these symptoms. Um, and that is different from hospice. Hospice is a little bit different uh, that it really does not focus anymore on uh, curative treatment. That doesn't mean like that you stop all medications. In, in hospice, you continue, like for example, steroid, anti-seizure medication, pain medication. All these things are, uh, they should not be stopped. But uh, like the, the main difference is really, there is no, uh, there's only a radiation for pain, but there's no chemotherapy, for example, uh, on hospice care. And you're mainly seeing that the hospice team and not the primary, your primary physician anymore. But even that said, it's, it's not black or white. I always tell my patients, it's like, I'm, and, and, I, that's, I, and I mean that. When I meet them in the beginning, and even, and especially when they go on hospice, I tell them, I'm, I, I'm, your, I'm your doctor, and I'm here, there with you from, from now, and if you choose all the way through. And uh, that doesn't change just because you're going on hospice now. Okay, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks again to Dr. Walbert for his wonderful webinar presentation. Besides our free educational webinars, ABTA has a variety of programs available to help connect patients and caregivers with information and resources to help to support them in their brain tumor journey as well as publications and resources for healthcare professionals. For more information, visit ABTA's website at www.abta.org or call the ABTA Care Line at 800-886-2282. Let's pause for just a moment to conclude our webinar recording. <laughs>